guest today is Artie Watson. He's running as an independent candidate in the St. John area, and we'll get to that in a bit. But first, welcome to the show. I'm Dennis Atchison. I'm your host. Thanks for tuning us in. So here's a thought as we approach the next provincial election, which is coming soon. We're recording this uh, August 17th, 2018, and we're doing it at the St. John Regional Library. So thanks to them for letting us use their space. So here's some research, and I want you to consider this. This is from the Government New Brunswick website. Under our system of parliamentary democracy, each of the 49 members of the Provincial Legislature Assembly is elected individually to represent the voters in one constituency or district. Although a member of the Legislative Assembly, MLA, need not be affiliated with an organized political party, historically that has been the case. I wanted us to remember our history because independent candidates bring with them some of the authentic structure of how our province was governed in the first place. And many people have recognized that the problem with politics today is party politics. So Artie Watson, thanks so much for being here today. Happy to be here. So how brave do you feel with being an independent candidate? Uh, it's a challenge. Uh, I'm looking forward to the opportunity to represent those you know, within the constituency that I'm uh, applying for. Which is Portland? Portland Simons. Portland Simons. And um, when I did some homework for this, um, voter turnout was a little rough last time. According to um, doing some research, there was 5,388 people that didn't vote. And Trevor Holder won last time with 2,780 votes. So almost twice as many people didn't vote as voted for Mr. Holder. I think a majority of those that didn't vote uh, come from the priority neighborhoods, uh, poor people. Yeah. Generally, that's, that seems to be what's been happening for the last four or five elections. Want to speak to that a bit? That, that's a major issue. And um, I just feel maybe they're not totally uh, engaged because the lack of knowledge, maybe, or lack of interest. I don't think maybe government has done a really great job or education system actually informing individuals of, of the importance of, of voting for mm -hmm. the representatives. Do you have some personal stories? Do you know some people without names? You know, it's just a circumstance, a situation, so more people understand what it's uh, like. I don't think there's a mistrust, I believe, perhaps. <laughs> within it. I, I'm, the reason I'm here and why I'm doing this is because of an incident from Churchill Boulevard uh, about a decade ago when they promised to rebuild a community neighborhood and it never never happened. So they were manipulated. If there's some animosity towards that, maybe mistrust towards government. So what happened in the case to bring people up to speed with um, that boulevard? Uh, there was the reports, there was a, a survey done or a document done by Avid, Avid Group out of Moncton and it suggested that the, the housing would be uh, replaced, would be cheaper to replace the building than to refurbish them. So the goal was to uh, move everyone out and try to find places for them uh, for a small period of time and then gradually, if they wished, they could return to their community. That was yeah, a decade ago now, and that didn't transpire. So we're asking questions, well, what happened? There was you know, rumors going on that the land was contaminated, uh, that there was lack of interest for development for a mixed income community. I have not seen any reports that, that would suggest that the land was contaminated, nor did I see any reports that there were no interest in develop, redevelopment from the builders, hmm. their contractors, builders, uh, developers. So has anything happened in that space since? It's been 10 years, and, and how are the people faring that were displaced from their homes? Uh, there was a number of uh, people who lost, lost their pets, lost uh, relatives, family members. Just, they just passed on uh, illness. As far as I know, from what I've researched, was that they sold the land to the YMCA for one dollar. Uh, they sold the adjacent land to uh, Elias Investment Group, and they built they built a seniors complex on that that area. 
So that's what took its place. Yes. And no accommodation for that. No, people. there was no family units ever built. So my question was to Trevor Holder, what happened? Uh, why he didn't speak up for those, the rights of those the families that were displaced? And the YMCA is great for the community. There's no doubt about that, not only for St. John, but the surrounding area, the region. It, it's just, I think it was poor, poor judgment. Uh, I mean, it was like a lack of empathy for the families that were living there at the time. A, a group of families that uh, varied in, in level of incomes and education. And the majority, unfortunately, were uh, dis dysfunctional, I guess you could say. I know That's growing fair. up in that, I, I grew up in a dysfunctional family, alcoholism, drug addiction, mm -hmm. and suffered myself uh, with addiction, mental illness, uh, learning disabilities. You know, as time went by, I, I sort of struggled, but mm -hmm. having that happen, I lost both my parents during that the last 10 years after. It was a few months before the, the move that my father had passed away due to stress, perhaps. Uh, mm -hmm. It was un unforeseen, un it's, it was a shock, basically. Just, uh, it was... It's good, uh, um, in the sense that you're giving us a glimpse of what it's like. Mainstream media will report development generally is a good thing. We never get the background story as to how these changes occurred who got title over this property, who got permission to build that there. Where was the public conversation around this? Where was the public trust on mm -hmm. the promised transition strategy? Right, there's lacks of transparency. There's, uh, because of the Privacy Act, there's no, you know, I did apply for access to information and yeah. uh, was uh, declined. I wanted to find out more about Elias, Elias Group yep. that, and more about the the transfer of the land to the YMCA and how that process worked. Uh, basically the, the Right to Information Act has clauses in it that uh, prohibits certain information from becoming public. So it's a lack of transparency in that sense. We hear a lot about that in the media these days. Uh, the Meta V Blue Cross contract is one where uh, there's been many requests for access to information. And it's um, the Privacy Act is often cited as uh, the buffer, the barrier. Um, so that was enough, probably more than enough, to get you into running as an independent candidate. It, it was. That's what propelled me to this, this spot in time. It was. It was definitely over over the period of uh, several years. It was a, quite the transition, overcoming certain addictions. Uh, trying to get over the fear of doing public presentations and speaking up, I mean, and then having a backlash against certain people or ridiculed for, for wanting to speak up, you know, they, you know, claim that the YMCA was great for the community. I don't dispute that, that it was great for the community. Hmm. Um, but what about the 88 families that were displaced and promised that they would be able to return to their community? You know, you, that's one issue among many that... Do you have similar stories from other parts of town? Because quite often that tends to be a pattern as any community tries to rejuvenate itself, but some see it as an opportunity for development, but they don't complete the circle of thinking. So if you're going to move these people, then something has to be done to help them. And the whole issue of poverty in and around St. John or New Brunswick in general is one that we still are not having the best conversation about. No, and I think there's a lack of empathy and, and a lack of understanding of what the real issues are other when it comes to poverty and poverty reduction. I mean, we're, we're sort of making inroads into the issue, in my opinion. Uh, the only thing I can think of from history is when they did the urban, re urban renewal for St. John and when they tore down in the 50s a bunch of communities and neighborhoods. And that's what kind of where the second phase of the rifle range was developed and brought in families from the East End uh, all around the city that was being rejuvenated with urban renewal. That's the only thing. And now you look at the old North End, uh, there's the houses all boarded up. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's lack of investment. And these are this is a neighborhood that's also in uh, Trevor Holder's riding. Mm -hmm. 
uh, I just feel after 17 years, you would think um, he'd have a great handle on things. And I mean, I'm sure there are things that he has done that contributed to the riding. Um, I know he's made a lot of people wealthy with his uh, work. So let's speak about you a bit and what you would like to do as assuming you win in in September. What what would you like to see change? Like what gets your juices going for I think the positive side of this? There's uh, there's many issues that uh, are, that will be addressed or that have to be addressed. And I think bringing people in, leaving the door open as a bipartisan approach rather than I think party politics is always partisan our way and that's it, you know. It's it's unfortunate, but that's that seems to be the way things generally go. Uh, for me, I think I'll keep my door open and always have the opportunity to allow people to come in, professionals to to work on issues such as uh, poverty reduction. I think perhaps we need to look at a pilot program for a universal basic income. I think that might be one approach. There's taxes, property taxes uh, for investment. As far as double taxation, I mean, that needs to be looked at. Uh, education reforms, uh, as far as more teachers in the classroom, maybe a restructuring of what some of the curriculum looks like. Uh, when it comes to health care, uh, a lot of people complain about lack of doctors, uh, too, many, too much wait times in the waiting areas. I mean, these are all things that are um, definitely going to be pursuing and working on, fighting for. Do you find that those that you listed off um, might have a greater impact on the people who are more disadvantaged than the people who have access to more disposable income or access to transportation? Definitely. I think, uh, I mean, when you look at the numbers, it's pretty startling. 53% of, of the population is, you know, somewhat illiterate. Uh, highest po child poverty rates. Uh, it's it is troubling, and these are things that we we in this day and age should have a handle on. You know, I think it's important to move forward, but also reconcile from the past. I and mean, I think a lot of a lot of issues that arise with poverty and addiction come from uh, maybe domestic violence, violence, uh, lack of lack of understanding as far as what what drives people in those situations what puts them there i think i think we focus on that let the experts come in and talk about it i mean there's been dozens of studies done over time so we should be able to figure something out i mean it is 2018 <laughs> <laughs> you're there you're allowed to be a little upset about it you know right. it's been going on for a while i remember senator ermine cohen from st john doing a child poverty study in canada it was 1987 88 mm. You could probably take much of that study and still apply it today, which then probably leads to why you want to get in politics, because in some ways politics are the sticking point rather than the breakthrough point. And again, it's, it's about being bipartisan. I mean, when you have 49 seats and you take the approach that, okay, well, we're going to do things, this is the way it's going to be without bringing in the other side and, and allowing them to offer their suggestions or even working together on the solutions. I think it's important. Yeah, a good idea shouldn't be hindered by um, what color party that you're with. Exactly. I think now it doesn't really, it shouldn't matter what uh, political stripe you are, or political affiliation. I think it's, it's important now to move beyond that and come together and really tackle what the issues are. I mean, it's all about prosperity and not leaving anyone behind. You know, if we if we continue to continue to allow communities like Churchill Boulevard just to let that slide or give them a free pass on that, and throwing people under the community is just or under the bus is just not a way of moving forward. Part of the challenge is getting people to be open and speak freely about this stuff. A lot of times in communities, it's like um, here's the portrayal of the good. So new development is good, but they never attach. Well, what was there before, and and how does it be the good if these people are going to be suffering because of that? What comes to mind is the Vancouver Olympics. So Vancouver needed to clean up, 
clean up the city a little bit. So they displaced all of the homeless people where they had put themselves, put in a bunch of condos that became temporary housing for people coming to be to the Olympics. And it, if I remember my numbers right, two years after the Olympics were done in Vancouver, there was a $300 million loss on those buildings. The newspaper only reported the financial aspects. They didn't loop it all the way back to the number of people that had been displaced in the first place to create that space for the newcomers to come in. So something's not connecting in the conversation. And you would have that opportunity as an MLA to build that bridge or connect that space. Yes, that will be definitely an opportunity to address that issue. Which then gets into if you're the lone independent in the legislature, um, do you have thoughts about how to be an effective voice to make that happen? Uh, well, I think it's engaging uh, other members, um, getting outside uh, assistance from organizations, for be nonprofit organizations that deal with poverty, uh, allowing that sense. I, and I realize that the challenge there is going to be a challenge as an independent. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a freedom too, in a way. There is, uh, and uh, hopefully we'll have a minority government. I mean, that would yeah. be the ideal condition. Why I read that um, information at the beginning was to help remind the audience that many New Brunswickers might not know that the original structure of the province and its governance was independent candidates. The political party system came along a few decades later. We know it that way because it's been 80 to 100 years of that process, so we think it's always been that way. And if uh, a province of 750 to 760,000 people have 49 representatives, it would be up to those 49 to make it work. Exactly. And I think there's a lot of outside influence from uh, big business, perhaps. Maybe make it hamper things as far as when it comes to solving uh, the, the critical issues that need to be solved. And when it can, becomes about profit rather than people, I mean, that's definitely... I think we're at a, a great point in history where we can actually tackle these uh, dire issues with, with people in mind rather than profits. I think that's important. Do you think we have the resources? Most definitely. Definitely we have the means, we just lack the will. I think having that opportunity as an independent, I will definitely uh, be very vocal about that. You know. So it's, I don't know everything about everything, but I mean, Google, right? <laughs> there's, a, there's a way of, of I, I do believe that there's a way of, of, of tackling the issues without uh, severe uh, damage to other uh, social systems or a system. I, it's, it is a system that needs to be overhauled, definitely, uh, when it comes to our judicial system, um, Education, healthcare, I mean, these are all things that can be, can be improved with a little bit of will from all sides rather than one political party setting the agenda for the next four years. And then yeah. we don't need that, another four years of that. And then if there's a change in who's um, in power, then there's another two years before you're up and running again because quite often one political party will dismiss or marginalize the direction that the previous party was doing. And so it takes a while to restructure things. I'm thinking of an anecdote from Randy Hatfield from the Human Development Council here in St. John when he was on the show four years ago, speaking to his um, frustrations. To, I'll speak on his behalf, but he might not say the word frustration. Mm -hmm. But every time a government changes, he had to start from scratch when he got into applying for funding because the new government would have a different program strategy that they wanted to impose and he was just getting some programs up and running and starting to mature therefore be more effective out in the community don't we can't do that anymore they've changed the criteria we have to apply for this now and that constant rotation meant it was no way that the grassroots service groups working with them were going to have an impact because it's 10 or 15 years to fix something not two or three years i think that's probably important to have flow over basically when they sign up for programs that it you know it extends beyond uh, the next election yeah how do you make it um, not to the whim of the political party in power but something that stands on its own that's right so um, 
conversations at home with becoming a, a candidate, um, even if it's conversations with yourself about, do I really want to do this? Um, yeah, there's put been, myself up there, you know? Yeah, many times I thought that, you know, going through, you know, uh, you know, the stress of it all, basically, just uh, throwing yourself out there in the public eye, it's not easy. And then talking about, you know, previous addictions and health issues with mental uh, yeah. health. If it's okay, um, you brought it up a couple of times. Do you think that's important to tell people up front? Yeah, I think so. It doesn't, yeah, nothing, I shouldn't hide those types of things. Okay. Uh, it was definitely a struggle. And losing both parents and family pets over that move it definitely was very a trying time it's tomorrow and I, I you know it's uh, the resilience from that it was it was great uh, just learning to get back up again and, and keep fighting and and keep this issue alive mm -hmm. is it's important it, it's and that's what's driving me it's not you know having that that goal of of holding those accountable. I mean, that's what you go to the polls for. If things didn't work out the last time, well, then you hold those accountable for for what they did. Mm -hmm. you know, I think that's one of the reasons I, I decided to continue and, you know, put my hat in the ring again. Yeah. the uh, One of the luxuries you have is by being independent. So you could play that card an awful lot. It's like you're not beholden to anybody other than the constituents. And then that gets their voice right to the floor of the legislature rather than filtered through a backroom group or uh, some other thing that makes the MLA not able to represent their constituents. No, exactly. And, and you had mentioned about Mr. Hatfield and about you know, some of the goals that they, they, they're working on to alleviate some of the issues with poverty. I mean, as I said in the big earlier about having a, an open door policy as far as allowing people to come in and talk about that and suggest, and it's it's without the partisan mm -hmm. aspect of it. You know, I'm really I'm looking forward to it actually, and learning about you know creating bills and, and drafting bills with the with the aid of some of the clerks. It's yeah. yeah. So here's a thought: it would be a challenging question, but you must have run into it by now. Um, in the political forum, oh, you'll never be in power, so why should I vote for you? Yeah, there's a lot of that. <laughs> I think it's important that people realize that uh, it can happen if they use their freedom to vote. Uh, and it's, I, I don't really get it. Maybe it's, they feel that there doesn't matter who they vote for, that they will never get what they really want. But I think if they take in the consideration that it's important to exercise their right, their freedom to choose. Uh, and we look at the governments in the past, the margins of people who vote, and you know, you look at 32% of the population being represented by, or 100% or of the population represented by 32% of the vote, yep. and everything is all one-sided. It's, yep. it's not, it doesn't seem like a fair democratic system to me. Yep. And by being an independent candidate, you offer a choice that, um, in some ways, voters don't see very often. I think in the last election there were nine independent candidates, not 49. So it's not quite in the culture yet here mm -hmm. that um, this is a legitimate option choice. And it is effective because it is your MLA. <laughs> it, it doesn't matter if it's a political um, party attached to it or being in power attached to it. No, I think it's important that to elect someone who's going to look after the, the rights of the people, who's always going to put their interests first rather than the interests of political party, uh, big business. It's about it's about people, and that's what it should be focused on in this election. It should be about people. Um, do you have any stories from doing some door to door yet? Just, uh, you know, it's hot. People, <laughs> yeah, hot understatement. People don't want to be bothered with someone coming to the door, you know, at this time. I mean, um, majority of people want to be engaged with their political representative. Maybe they might want to change the, uh, the time frame for elections, maybe move it a little further. 
maybe October, November, rather than it's just too hot to be going door to door and subjecting people to questions they don't really. It's interesting, eh? Because it's um, when you go door to door, in some ways, it's an intrusion on that household's moment in time, their energy, and if uh, and when it gets dark and you knock on the door, that's like you can't you can't do that because people yes. find it strange. So a late fall election, for example, it's dark at seven o'clock. It cuts the chance down. But do you have stories of uh, uh, any anecdotes of um, an odd question somebody might have asked you or? A nice moment when somebody understood what you were trying to do and were thankful that you were there to give them that choice? Yes. I think bringing up the, you know, the idea of having a, a universal basic income for those that are, you know, fall under the, the poverty line. I mean, that's, that's something that really inspired people or, or gave them hope. I mean, to be honest, they're, they're struggling. Uh, when you, you have an income of $500 a month, 560 for a single person, uh, and your rent's, you know, $400, it doesn't leave much for anything else. And that in itself uh, is demoralizing. Just having, having, having said that, To move, to move beyond where we're at as far as the poverty, I think it's it's challenging. And people, one person, seen that and, and thought that would be a great opportunity not only to provide healthier food, uh, better medications, or uh, an extra class. Or, or even, yeah. Yeah, well, people, generalizing, but people tend to just see one thing and focus on the one thing. They don't see the whole pattern or the flow of the system. But if you provided a guaranteed annual income to families, there's study after study that shows the benefits to the whole community, the economic positive impacts, the standard of health positive impacts, the house security positive, and once you have a secure home and you know you're going to eat, a whole lot of the emotional issues and, and healing issues settle because you've got a home that's an anchor, which then reduces costs on the extra services needed to constantly intervene. Um, so it's striking where we've got all this information and studies and proof and test pilot programs. But we're now on the cusp of actually, let's go do it now. We don't need to study it anymore. No, exactly. I think it's important to actually revisit those studies and actually, you know, start implementing some of those studies and pilot projects. And not only, universal basic income can actually help with lowering the cost of incarceration rates, uh, health care, education. Yep. I think it's important to realize that it, this might be exactly what's needed. And we look towards the future when automation, uh, robotics take over a lot of these jobs that, that are, are going to disappear in the future. So what are we going to replace that with? We can't have, you know, food banks are great, but if we don't have a system in place, it's, it doesn't look very promising in the future. You are the only candidate so far who has brought that point up. I've brought it up in interviewing some of the other leaders, you know, Blaine Higgs and Chris Austin and Dave um, Kuhn and Jennifer McKenzie. Uh, when they get talking about jobs in the economy, I'll ask, what are you going to do about artificial intelligence and robotics? And sort of aware of it, but it's not right in front. You're the first one to mention that this is going to have an impact, and it's going to have an impact on the people that you're the most aware of. Because it would be those service industry jobs and some of those um, physical jobs, warehouse kind of jobs. It will be done by automation instead of... And it's, 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 it's going to happen quicker than we think. Yeah. It's, it's here now. It's just a matter of having the operations in place. I mean... Yeah. Well, when Moose had retrofitted their plant three or four years ago, um, about 100, 120 jobs or so disappeared because they had new production line put in and it was fully automated. 
there'll be more and more of that as we go. Um, do you have any other stories from the, the doorsteps? You know, someone say, oh, good for you, you're an independent. I'm tired of the other two parties. Um, someone say you're crazy. You're an independent. I'm getting all that. Yes, you'll never, you'll never make it. Yeah, an independent party. No, independent. It's, uh, and I think there's a lot of, of that. You know, people are misinformed, uh, uneducated as far as, you know, how the political system actually works, and I, I think it's important that we really address that as far as educating individuals and how do we get in get into their homes to educate them and that's that might be the challenge rather than going door to door there might be other opportunities um there's moments when um anyone will be searching for a word to try to say it the right way but you were just pointing out that some people will be picky like you have to be a newsreader and say everything duck 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 you know exactly so do you think there's some wiggle room out there for um, just being you and, and saying, hey, this is me, this is where I come from, and sometimes I look for a word? There's other people who will just talk and fill up space like I'm doing right now, I hope and they're so. not really saying anything, right? Right. That's one of the things I thought about when I was doing this, you know, about having to be perfect. Obviously, that's not, I mean, none of us are perfect, right? But you want to you get the message out there, that, and you want to look you know, professional. professional enough that you're going to be able to represent these people, you know, in the legislature. And a lot of people don't really understand what the job entails. As a MLA, I realize it's it's sort of directing people to directing people to the right bureaucracy through the bureaucracy of everything. As far as yeah, yeah. so that was a challenge. Um, thinking about overthinking things too, just trying to be. Trying to bring your A game. That's right. And everybody <laughs> wants to bring their A game. Some days, hey, it's B. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's real. That, that's good because it's transparent, it's honest, and people will support you with that compared to um, I'm not going to answer you or I said this last time, but yeah, I'm going to go do this now. Uh, everyone's yes. f filled up with that. Ultimately, politics is about human relationships. We haven't brought it down to that level yet, but your participation brings us back to that, reminds us of that. Right. There's always a, a lot of running around the issue kind of thing, and talking about, over the issue, I find, really not being as transparent as, as they should be. That's kind of one of the reasons why I'm here, you know, to bring transparency and to find out you know, what actually happened in some, some of the issues in the past. As you do your campaign, um, and the other parties will start cranking theirs up even more, so, mm -hmm. so in some ways you're going to get drowned out from habitual behavior, traditional behavior. Hopefully not, you know. But, um, oh, where was I going to go with this now? It had to do with um, the power of the independent candidate and voice, and whether people understand um, general public understand it's it's like a two month long now job application process yes <laughs> it's it's trying sometimes and fairly mentally exhausting at times but then again it's exhilarating and exciting mm -hmm. to be able to take part in this I feel really blessed and honored to to be able to step forward I mean that's that's democracy right mm -hmm. and that's the way it should work uh, everybody should have an opportunity to put their hat in the race whether they be wealthy or, or poor. And I think coming from a poor uh, environment, growing up poor, uh, I'm really grateful for this opportunity. Yeah. What was it like to apply as an independent candidate? What's the process? Many people, of course, will never go on Elections NB well, website yeah. to find out. So right. is it expensive? Do you have to get a lot of names on a, on a sheet? There's or... uh, about 25 names that you want to get at least 30 or 40 names. Uh, for the nomination, there's a hundred dollar deposit required. You have to have an official agent and someone who understands uh, about campaigns and raising money, uh, keeping keeping records of uh, money's coming in, money's going out. <laughs> I'm very fortunate because there's not a lot of money going <laughs> in, right? So, yeah. Um, if somebody wanted to support your campaign, do they have a way of yes. finding you? Yes, yes. Artie, artie.independent at gmail.com, right? 
Great. So that'll There's help. definitely a way. Yes. Yeah. Um, the other parties, and media love doing this as a traditional storyline. They will equate uh, the size of the budget that a political party will have with their opportunity for success. Um, mm. There never really has been any way to completely confirm that that's the case, that you can buy an election because you've got more money in your war chest or all these other phrases they use. Um, I think it's very helpful, uh, definitely helpful. Yeah. And so, it's also unbalanced and it's unfair. It, that's a very unfortunate. And, and this year we've got new fundraising rules and new donation rules where there's maximums for people and no more companies, and no more unions, right. ide ideally. It's great for the parties, I think, but Is when it, it comes to independence, when they raised, not, I mean, if I, had, if I was a wealthy person, it would be great, but unfortunately I'm not. Hmm. But in, in the, before the election, post-election, before the election, it's, the numbers don't sort of match up. I mean, when you've got the political parties compared to independence, uh, the ratio of uh, money that you're allowed to spend is definitely unfair. I mean, it's $3,000 before the election for an independent, whereas uh, political parties can spend upwards of $200,000. It just doesn't seem... So they're trying to... You know, that's a way of gaming the system against, against independence. <laughs> We did. I didn't know that. That's great to learn that. How about during an election? Um, your ability to fundraise versus theirs. Um, do you have the same spending limits they have? Uh, I believe so. Yes. Okay. So if you can Less raise twenty-five thousand, you'd I be able spend, to spend twenty-five thousand yes, during the election. Yes, I can spend that amount. Now to find the twenty-five thousand. Yeah. <laughs> How goes it for for supplies? Do you? Um, do the traditional approach to campaigning, uh, lawn signs, big billboards, um, that sort of thing, if you that's, have the resources? I think that to get the message out, I think that's important. Uh, but when you're strapped for cash, you, ha you have to be very uh, creative mm -hmm. in, in your approach to getting that message out. And it, you know, door to door, you know, even knock on 10 doors, you know, nine of those doors at this point in time, maybe not home on vacation yeah. or just not interested. Uh, as far as uh, pamphlets go and, and flyers or rack cards, uh, it can be really expensive. Uh, and you want to get um, publications that come from local printers. You don't want to go outside. Like key industries, it, something right? like that, to get yes. your, your PR material. Um, have you been included yet on any lists for um, public debates, um, meet the Chamber of Commerce, uh, the traditional things that pop up during an election time? Uh, there is going to be a debate with the Nick Nicole Center on the uh, North End. That's coming up September 5th, 6th, I believe, around that time. And you're included? The 5th, yes, I'm included in that one. I have yet to receive any other uh, notifications about any others. Okay, great. Um, so, okay, if I ask, how, do you have a team helping you, or I have you a couple kind of people find, who so? I got the majority of the things that are happening are uh, my effort. I do have a couple of people who help out once in a while, but they they have their own lives, and, yeah. and it is summertime. So, and that wasn't meant to put you on the spot, but oh. many people might not realize that it might be portrayed as this wonderful, organized, systemic campaign thing. But in a lot of cases, um, candidates have a couple of family and friends that are helping them get signs up and get some mm -hmm. flyers and mailboxes and trying to get the word out that uh, there's many choices this election. There's five or six or seven choices in some cases. Right. And it's, I mean, in democracy, it's, you know, you should have many, many opportunities or many choices rather than, it's not... A, the two-party system needs needs to be addressed, and that can be addressed by the voter turnout, you know, and it, for them to get engaged and really, really study the issues, really study the candidates, you know, who's really out to represent their interest. In prepping for my interview with Jean Claude Basque, which will be coming up soon on the show, um, Jean Claude is with the Common Front for Social Justice been with them for a long time. They're based out of Moncton. And uh, I learned that 198,000 people didn't vote in the last provincial election. When Jean-Claude came on, he made a direct correlation between that and poverty levels. 
He said, all Dannister is like 102 to 110,000 people living below the poverty line in Brunswick. And my little light bulb goes on. Is there a correlation, Jean-Claude? And he spoke well and at length <laughs> about that correlation between they don't feel like they should or they know enough or are entitled or have been taught because the school system let them down. And you touched on that lately at the front end of this interview. Um, if there's to be a breakthrough then in elections in 2018, do you have some thoughts about how to get all those people who feel like they're disenfranchised from the process and that they have a voice in the process, to how to get them to, to know, but this is really important because it will affect you directly if you can get RD in there or if you can get someone that's listening to what you need in there. Do you have some thoughts about that? Because you've kind of lived it in the past. Yeah, I think it's, it's getting the message out and having the resources to be able to do that. Yeah. So what would those resources be? And it comes to money and and just going out and talking with people. And oh, that's what you mean. Okay. I mean, as far as uh, literature goes, and maybe some, I mean, the reality of it is there are a lot that don't, don't can't we? read. So how do we get them to the polls? How do we how do we get them to understand that, uh, even a little bit of the process? Do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, there's some of the priority neighborhoods that have uh, you know great organization communities committees that uh, work in hand in hand with the communities trying to uh, bring people in, and I think they're informing and being able to inform them and helping them become engaged with their communities. I think that's that's where it's where it's where it's at. I think. So like a grassroots movement, uh, public yes. education. There's Helping been... them become more a part of it and giving them an opportunity to take part and, and to organize themselves and yeah. speak about the issues. I mean, that's important. They well, need to realize that the issues that they're faced with, they have, they have just as much right to speak of them as those that... Uh, have more resource, more resources or disposable income than they do. Yeah, and that putting a tick on a ballot is directly connected to what they live through day to day. Exactly. Because they, they might not connect those two things because, oh, that's all rubbish. Or last time we dealt with them, they took our home away. Yes, there's a lot of animosity towards that and mistrust. Uh, yeah, definitely. So you would be able to build that bridge then because you I know hope to. them. Yes, that's... You know, that's one of the goals is to get, get in there and, and obviously it's going to be a learning curve uh, and I'm sure it, as most elective members will find out that, you know, it's starting from scratch and learning how the system works within yeah. the legislature itself. Yeah, they have orientation sessions for rookies. Right. You'll get to be a rookie again. And again, after 17 years, uh, you would think Mr. Holder has quite a handle on things. Uh, unfortunately, um, he has failed in my, my eyes as far as representing the interests of the poorer communities. Uh, and, and I'm not going to take away everything he's done. I'm sure he has done some great things. And But when it comes to Churchill Boulevard, he failed. And for that reason, he needs to be held accountable. Many incumbent MLAs present themselves when they're back for re-election um, in terms of what they've done for the constituency. And a lot of times they translate that in terms of money. Exactly. So you'll see brochures and flyers, I've brought $200,000 into this community to do this, or I've brought uh, $2 million into the community to do that. In fact, it's a whole group that has to make that decision together, not just one. And I've always been curious, why always the attention just on money, not on the other things? Right. Have you, you know, as you sit back and analyze all this stuff, it, do you see that as consistent with Mr. Holder? Or no. do you see a different way of doing this? There has, there, it's, I'm sure if we look at the studies that have been done, and we look at the current situation that we have in New Brunswick, as far as the high poverty rates, the literacy rates, uh, still talking about people waiting for doctors and waiting, it's 
doesn't seem like after 17 years that he's really made any progress in that area. So you'd be saying it's time for a change. Definitely time <laughs> for a change. It's it's definitely time for a change. So I think it's time for you know a new vision uh, and a bipartisan vision. <laughs> yeah. hmm. No, that's good. Who who are your uh, competitors for the position? Uh, right now, it's uh, John McKenzie for the Liberals, Trevor Holder for the PCs, Kim Blue for NDP, and there's. Uh, a People's Alliance candidate as well. Great. At this point in time, yes. So there's, so that's a full slate for our general public to pay attention to. Um, other than your email account, is there another place that people want to find out about you? There's uh, already Watson uh, page, uh, Facebook. Great. Great. That helps. We'll put that yes. too in, in uh, taglines underneath when we post the show up. So maybe some final thoughts, Eric. Uh, couple of moments still to go. Um, so the legislature, it sounds like in general there's more buzz about shaking up the two-party dynamic in the legislature. So playing best case scenario and you're in there, do you have a way to speak to how those that think that'll make it dysfunctional rather than more functional? Can you help them through that decision that, man, if I vote for you, um, it's not that you're not going to win, but I, I'm afraid the legislature won't get anything done because minority governments and you can't be in power, so they're just going to squabble all the time and trip on each other and never get anything done. Even though history has pointed out that Canada's most progressive legislation comes with minority governments and with working together. Yeah, I think if they get beyond the, the that belief that, you know, a minority government is not going to... I guess it's in, in the mindset of people, because that's that's the lies that have been told maybe over generations that a minority government uh, will leave them nowhere. That, that's uh, very unfortunate that they think like that. I think if they realize that it's really about having a representative who's going to speak up. I mean, as a representative, I'm still going to have the opportunity to speak up. I'm still going to have the opportunity to approach other members to. Uh, draft bills or even the the uh, clerks to draft bills and to have the opportunity to speak with other members as far as getting those bills to the floor and mm -hmm. voted on. So in a lot of ways the work of an MLA is over and above the party politics in a way. It should be, definitely. And it's unfortunate that you know, the partisan approach to it and the party politics hinder um, growth, in my view. Do you have any thoughts about New Brunswick in general as a place to live, a place to do business? I think it's a beautiful, beautiful province. And I think we're at a point in history where we have great opportunity. It's about, like I said before, it's about, about the will. I mean, we have the means. It's. I think we lack the will, and I'm not sure why is that. And I think it's about having new vision and going, thinking outside the box, and going beyond what we've been doing, and actually going back as well and, and doing some research on some of the, the studies that have been done as far as, uh, you know, when it comes to economic development or education reform, healthcare reform, and poverty reform, or you know how do we how do we move beyond the state that we're in and I think if we can go back and look at some of the studies that have already been done and bring the professionals to the table and have the discussion you know now is the time this is the great opportunity it's 2018 let's do this you have any final thoughts no thanks very much for your time and uh, on election day vote for Artie Watson <laughs> well done like a real pro <laughs> it's great Thank you for watching. If you like the work we do, support the show, share the show, make comments on the show. Be good, have fun, love each other. The Dennis Report is an independent media production. To support the program, go to DennisAtchison.com and click Become My Patron on Patreon.